Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, thank you uh, all for uh, joining us uh, on the third day of the Rise in Our Dialogue. Uh, and it's a really encouraging sign to see so many people up bright and early at uh, 9.30 a.m. to, to 9.15 a.m. To, uh, to discuss uh, something uh, that's not the most up always the most uplifting subject, uh, but the future of the nuclear order. Um, it's interesting to, to sort of consider why we are discussing this subject at this time, uh, in this location, and in this format. Um, I, I think if, if you think back over the last 50 odd years, in 1963, uh, Robert McNamara, the US Secretary of Defense at the time, uh, wrote a memo to President Kennedy, and he was trying to assess the future of the nuclear order at the time. Um, and in, in 63, there were, there were four nuclear, declared nuclear powers, the US, the Soviet Union, the UK and France, but McNamara believed that four more, China, Israel, India, and Sweden, uh, were about to imminently test. And that by 1973, 10 years later, there he estimated there would be about 12 states with nuclear weapons. Now, such assessments, and these were quite common assessments at the time, uh, proved to be quite wildly off the mark. Uh, today, um, uh, over half a century later, uh, and this really is a testament to the, the strength of the international order, uh, there, are really, there are only nine states uh, with, uh, that possess nuclear weapons, and only one of them, North Korea, has been testing weapons over the past 19 years. India, which was once the primary nuclear pariah after its 1974 peaceful nuclear explosion, is today uh, integrating back into the arms control institutions, uh, having recently joined the missile technology control regime and the Vasanar arrangement. But equally, there are signs that the established order is fraying. North Korea's now regular nuclear and missile tests have raised concerns naturally around the world. Uh, but the fault does not lie in Pyongyang alone. Um, after a breakthrough in nuclear negotiations with Iran, there are now hints uh, that the United States may withdraw, which would be a disconcerting sign. Uh, the test uh, quite recently by China of hypersonic weapons has raised the prospect of another kind of arms race developing. Long-standing arms control arrangements between the United States and Russia may be fraying with mutual acquisition, uh, accusations uh, by both sides of, of violating commitments. Uh, and tactical nuclear weapons are now being explored by certain countries. So we have an excellent panel to discuss these and other related issues. Um, I'll briefly introduce them and I'll start off by asking each of them a question to kind of kick off our discussion. But I hope after about 25 minutes or so to, to open, the open the discussion up to all of you uh, and the floor. Uh, so starting off to my immediate right, uh, we have Ambassador Wendy Sherman, uh, who until recently was the US uh, Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, uh, which is the number three position at the US State Department. Uh, she played a key role in negotiating the Iran nuclear agreement uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, and has also, uh, in her long and distinguished diplomatic career, uh, been involved in negotiations with North Korea. Uh, as an aside, she also played a very important role in relations with India uh, during her time in government. Uh, to my far right is uh, Professor Shen Dingli uh, from China. Uh, pr uh, uh, Professor uh, Shen is actually one of the most outspoken uh, Chinese academics and somebody who I've uh, come to respect quite a lot in, in, in uh, discussions, particularly over the past year. Uh, from Russia, we have uh, Professor Wojtolovsky, um, uh, who will be, uh, who's uh, joined us uh, from, from Russia. We have uh, Professor Rory Metcalf of the National Security College of the Australian National University in Canberra, and Raji Rajagopalan. Uh, who is a fellow uh, specializing in space and nuclear issues at the Observer Research Foundation. I'll start off by uh, asking um, uh, Professor, uh, to, by, by uh, turning to Professor Shen uh, from China. I think uh, one of the issues that uh, is on a lot of people's minds right now is the North Korea situation. Um, so Professor Shen, um, given, given the international focus on North Korea as a major destabilizing factor in the nuclear order, um, some, including in South Korea, believe that Beijing could be doing a lot more uh, to constrain North Korea uh, and, and dissuade it from uh, its reckless uh, testing of nuclear and missile technology. Uh, do you think these criticisms of Beijing are fair? And uh, how would Beijing like, uh, ideally, to deal with Pyongyang? Well, I offer my personal take. We also think we can do a lot. And uh, we, every day we think we have done a lot but we become increasingly gloomy that despite a lot we have done, we cannot attain our objective to reverse DPRK's nuclear trajectory. And others still expect us to do more. China considers that we have done a lot. Uh, 
we much reduce the, the coal flow from North Korea to China. No seafood, no, uh, uh, much reduce the coal and uh, refusing lots of special uh, metal, no seafood, no garments, and to kick out their workers from China, closing their bank account, no financial transfer, and uh, much strengthen the border export uh, control, as well as uh, uh, recently closing their restaurant, etc. Mm -hmm. What else you want us to do? So as I tell us, you should close oil flow from China to DPRK. Yes, I agree. First, we can do even more. Cutting food, cutting fertilizer, cutting uh, medical supply, cutting the remaining co uh, oil. But personally, I believe even we do all this, North Korea would still do nuclear. And probably do more. That's my personal take. So China's argument is that we should combine uh, a carrot and stick together to provide both incentive and disincentive. The incentive is to still offer uh, food, uh, limited oil for uh, humanitarian purpose. So otherwise they can be driven crazy. Either they surrender or they would uh, 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 be forced into a corner. So we should prevent the worst scenario from happening. So China is unwilling to cut all which has a, a value for preventing a humanitarian disaster. But the loophole is North Korea can take the remaining amount of food and oil from China to divert for non-humanitarian purpose, for military purpose. So that's the loophole. But we should talk to North Korea, talk to the UN, how to generate a transparent regime that uh, this uh, uh, delivery for humanitarian purpose would not be diverted. This is a thing that I think uh, we still should uh, strive for. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ambassador Sherman, I, I do want to turn, uh, turn our focus a little bit to Iran and of course your role in, in the nuclear, you played a very important role in the nuclear negotiation, but before, I, before that, just since we're on the topic of North Korea, um, do you think the, the current mix of disincentives and incentives, say engagement and, 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 and constraining North Korea of punitive measures, uh, do you think that th this is really the right path? I mean, there's been a long and rather messy history of, of trying to deal with North Korea's nuclear program. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, this panel today and thank the audience for being here, as you said, to come at 9.15 uh, after a, a long day yesterday to talk about nuclear weapons isn't exactly uplifting. Uh, mm -hmm. So appreciate the audience. Uh, Look, I have long called for a very coordinated, uh, use every tool in the toolbox, comprehensive strategy toward uh, North Korea. Uh, I believe that denuclearization should remain the objective. I think it will take a very long time to reach that objective, and there will indeed be interim steps along the way, but I don't think we should give up that objective because it goes to your larger point, which is, we want to try to make sure that other states don't believe their only choice is to get nuclear weapons. So we can't be for nuclear weapons. It, it's not the right approach. Uh, I think there are a lot of pieces on the table. What's not clear even in my own country by uh, the US administration, current US administration, whether this is a coordinated effort. It needs to be worldwide. Uh, it needs to be working with all partners there are pieces of the puzzle on the table, but it's not clear that they are well sequenced and well put together in a very focused way. I think the, the one other point I want to make, uh, and then I'll stop, is that the discussions between North and South Korea to ensure that the Olympics are safe and secure, I think are fine. Uh, and dialogue is important, but we should all be mindful uh, that North Korea uh, objective uh, in those discussions is not the same as South Korea's objectives in those discussions. North Korea's objectives is to really assert that North Korea uh, wants a reunified peninsula under North Korean control. Uh, and so South Korea has to be very careful, I think it is trying to be, to make sure that the North Koreans do not drive a wedge between South Korea and the rest of us who are trying uh, to reach, reach a solution. But it will take all of the countries on this stage and the entire international community to try to get this on the right track. 
Shifting our focus a little bit from our east to our west, um, the, how do you assess the uh, future prospects of the Iran nuclear deal framework um, following criticism of it and sustained criticism of it uh, by President Trump? Well, uh, those of us who worked very hard on this deal, and that includes all of the permanent members of the Security Council, Germany, the European Union, and everybody in this room, I want to thank India. Uh, India made a very tough choice, which was to reduce the amount of oil it bought from uh, Iran, uh, to try to put pressure on Iran for them to come to the table and have serious negotiations. And that was a sacrifice on India's part, and it was much appreciated and quite necessary uh, to get to the deal that was reached in 2015 and implemented in 2016. Uh, look, uh, the President, uh, as you all have seen, believes strongly in keeping promises he made on the campaign, though every President has made promises on campaigns that they find out in governing they can't and shouldn't keep. This is one he shouldn't keep to rip up the deal. The people around him have tried to impress upon him how important it is to keep this deal in place. And quite frankly, I've never understood why there's any reason to encourage Iran to get back on the path of getting a nuclear weapon. I don't really understand that logic. Um, nonetheless, the President has put an ultimatum out, as most of you in this audience know, that in the next 120 days, he wants a piece of legislation that addresses what he sees as problems in the deal. Uh, he wants Europe to be on board. He thought he had Europe on board, but did not. Uh, and so uh, we will have to have some very serious discussions. Uh, neither the U.S. Congress nor Europe like ultimatums. Uh, they believe they are free actors uh, and have a say in all of this. Uh, we will, all of us, I think, work very hard to preserve this deal because, as I said, the objective is to ensure Iran doesn't get a nuclear weapon, and why would you want to encourage Iran to get back on that path? Uh, Professor Wojtolowski, um, arms control talks between the United States and Russia, your country, uh, once formed the bedrock of U.S.-Russia engagement, but also the, the arms control, global arms control uh, talks. <laughs> Uh, but in recent years, both sides, both countries, have, have accused the other of violating treaties and arrangements between them. Now, given uh, the relationship between Russia on the one hand and, and uh, Europe and the United States on the other, um, can some of these differences be managed today, uh, or are we in for another round of nuclear modernization, a sort of renewed nuclear arms race in Europe? Thank you very much. It's a $1 million question. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm also very glad to be here, and I'm uh, very grateful to Observer Research Foundation for inviting me and for putting MMO as a partner of uh, Racina Diary. Uh, first of all, uh, we are entering into the new phase of development of arms control system in general on global level. For uh, decades, uh, arms control system uh, on uh, the global level was based on uh, Soviet-American and then Russian-American relationship on, uh, based on uh, mutual deterrence, uh, mutual uh, assured destruction, uh, the same understanding of many concepts uh, in, term of, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, you know, uh, reaction, in terms of uh, usage of offensive and defensive systems. Right now, we're entering into the uh, new phase of development of arms control system and new phase of development of mutual deterrence. Uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, the number of uh, nuclear uh, powers is growing and, uh, uh, and the non-proliferation regime is uh, uh, getting closer and closer to uh, the eclipse of uh, this regime, but on the other hand, in uh, uh, Russian-American relations, we see that we are facing uh, um, a period when, uh, you know, uh, the unpredictability of next steps on political, diplomatic, and, and on military level uh, could be uh, very high. Uh, first, uh, uh, in 2021, we should do something with the START Treaty um, uh, st uh, because uh, the period of uh, its uh, usage is uh, ending and we need uh, to renew this treaty, which was highly criticized by President Trump uh, as a weak deal, mm -hmm. as he said, or uh, to have a new treaty or to have nothing. There are different voices. Mm -hmm. I know in American 
uh, expert community, and there are different voices in Russian expert community, because Russia, uh, till this period, will, uh, will finish some modernizations of its uh, nuclear systems, and uh, the United States are entering to the period of uh, deep modernization of its nuclear threat. The same thing is uh, happening with INF treaty. You know, both sides are accusing each other in violations of INF treaty. Uh, uh, the United States has started it, but Russia also has a lot of to say about uh, uh, the violations of INF treaty from American side. And there are a lot of voices uh, in American Congress and the military political community, in including uh, some persons who are here today, uh, not on the stage. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, I know that uh, on a very high military level, there are people who are saying that for uh, different military political reasons, for different reasons of uh, development of deterrence system, uh, the United States are requiring uh, to have uh, intermediate, short range, and medium range uh, missiles in Asia Pacific especially. Uh, but in Europe, uh, together with development of uh, uh, ballistic missile defense systems, which Trump administration uh, is planning to restore as a you know, long-term and uh, um, you know, very important program for development of American uh, nuclear uh, defensive elements of uh, strategic nuclear potential. Um, it could uh, cause a very tough reaction from Russian side and it could cause a very uh, you know, complicated period in the terms of arm race. So uh, uh, together with uh, entering into this phase uh, of uh, arms control uh, uh, relationship between Russia and the United States and taking into account that China uh, could uh, receive a much higher uh, figures of uh, its nuclear potential in the, uh, in the next years, uh, taking into account the growing uh, military budget of China. Taking into account uh, that uh, on regional level, India, Pakistan, Israel, many other countries are uh, trying to develop their nuclear potentials. And taking into account uh, a very high, uh, you know, a possibility of eclipse of uh, the comprehensive common uh, action plan on Iran. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's uh, collapse. Uh, we are entering into the very dangerous period. Well, that, that, that was certainly uplifting. Um, the, uh, uh, Rory, uh, turning to you, I mean, I just, just if, if, if that wasn't, uh, I mean, if you, if you take all of these ag agreements, you know, whether it's on, or, or lack of agreement on North Korea, on Iran, on the INF and, and uh, START uh, treaties, uh, you come from a non-nuclear weapon state, uh, but all of these developments in, in these different regions do have re ha relevance for a country like Australia. Uh, what does the future of this emerging nuclear order mean for the larger international order? I mean, it seems to me that w w we have this very strange um, uh, two worlds that seem to coexist. One is this <coughs> multilateral, uh, people talking about banning nuclear weapons and stuff, and then, and then the reality, of course, is looks completely different. So do we actually have uh, a multilateral framework that is completely at odds with, with the reality of, of the international order? Are you looking for a one-word question? Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> because I think, look, I, th I, th I think in short there is that obvious uh, tension and contradiction. I mean, there are, there are two points I'd probably make in response to this. Firstly, what uh, do all these, these woes, these nuclear troubles of the world mean for uh, a country like Australia, for the middle powers, for the non-nuclear weapon states, albeit a country like Australia that has extensive strategic interests and uh, indeed an alliance with uh, the United States. But also that question about what does this changing nuclear order or disorder mean for the overall picture of international affairs and international order. And in fact, paradoxically, it could be that in the years ahead, nuclear weapons are one of the few predictable constants um, in, in the international order. So we, we have to, um, I guess, look a little bit at, the, um, at, at managing the benefits of that as well as the risks. I guess, um, just going to the Australian dimension for a minute, there's a few principles I'd emphasise really in answering any of these questions. One is that uh, nuclear weapons are everyone's business. And I think that, uh, uh, I know that you know, Australia and India and a number of other countries have had their differences over the years on these issues, but there's no question that the threat or the use of one nuclear weapon anywhere is going to ruin things 
for everyone, uh, and so middle powers, non-nuclear weapon states have a very strong vested interest in trying to help manage nuclear risk. Uh, indeed, this transcends geography. I mean, uh, as someone who's, who's advocated the, uh, the Indo-Pacific idea that has infused this, this conference, um, ironically, I'd say that uh, uh, geography doesn't matter so much <laughs> when it comes to, to nuclear weapons. Uh, we have to worry about the risks everywhere. But the second issue is precisely that point uh, that you've alluded to, Driver, which is the, uh, the tension between uh, a really quite utopian disarmament vision and uh, the realities that we face. And, and, you know, the, for example, the new US nuclear posture review, a draft of which is doing the rounds at the moment and makes us some quite um, bracing reading, uh, you know, is in some ways a sign of, a sign of the times. It's actually not uh, really a sign of where Trump is at personally. I think it's actually a sign of where the US strategic community is at. Nuclear weapons are not going away anytime soon. And any of these disarmament initiatives uh, really have to come to terms with the deterrence question because I think the, the problem, the principal problem we face for the near future and the medium future is not that there are too many nuclear weapons in the world, it's that uh, the use might become a reality or even the threat of their use might be enough to create new uh, proliferation, proliferation ripples. And so I guess in my own view it's pretty irresponsible to be uh, pursuing disarmament without grappling with the deterrence question at the same time and that goes for NGOs or for countries that sometimes uh, resemble, resemble NGOs. Um, the, I guess the, the question then for Australia and for, for really all of us uh, is, is what do we do and I, I would argue that one of the big opportunities ahead is about the intersection of nuclear weapons and international order and all of the disruptive change that we're seeing. Uh, for example, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the whiz kids of the 1960s or the nuclear theorists of the 1950s, if they were around today, they wouldn't be grappling with pure nuclear deterrence issues. Uh, we, we need those minds and the next generations to grapple with the intersection of nuclear risk and all of the other disruptive changes we're seeing. Cyber, I think hypersonics uh, were mentioned. Uh, frankly, uh, the intersection of uh, nuclear weapons and the misuse of social media um, is something we probably all need to um, to be understanding a hell of a lot, a hell of a lot. As, as, as the people of Hawaii have discovered. As the recently. people of Hawaii have discovered, yeah. indeed, um, or as any reader of President Trump's uh, Twitter account has discovered. So, so I think <laughs> that um, these these actually the big questions: the intersection of nuclear and cyber, nuclear and maritime, um, the fact that there are SSBN programs in the region. Uh, which are going to be pretty challenging to, um, to, make, to make operational. Uh, and I would say that uh, the middle powers, the well-meaning uh, non-nuclear weapon states really need to bring their, their intellectual and diplomatic and intelligence efforts to bear on those issues before they go to the, um, the utopian abolition uh, argument again. Uh, briefly, just a, a quick follow-up, I mean, just because you alluded to it. In, we, we've, in some ways, seen an absence of great power conflict in the last 60 plus, in the post-World War II mm. era, uh, in part you could say because of nuclear deterrence, uh, although I, I think that that itself would be controversial in some mm. circles. But uh, in any case, we've seen in some ways the, the superiority of defensive weapons over offensive weapons, and we've now come to take that for granted. Are some of these new technological developments in the defense realm, cyber, AI, robotics, mm. now threatening to reverse that? And I know this gets off the nuclear path a little bit, but it, as, as you said, these are these are in intertwined today. So, do you do you, are you more pessimistic about the future of great power conflict, given these technological developments? Well, it's not only great power conflict. I think that one of the things that both practitioners and theorists need to come to terms with is that we don't know anymore what a strong state and a weak state looks like, because these days weak states, uh, relatively speaking, can inflict great harm on strong states through precisely all of those asymmetric means that you're talking about. Um, and so, it, yeah, look, look I, I do think it even uh, reinterprets the meaning of what great power conflict uh, is, is all about. Uh, and, and frankly, these make the deterrence problems of the 1950s and 60s look, look pretty damn simple. So um, there's an enormous, uh, enormous agenda there. Raji, uh, we, we're sitting here in India, and you know, India has two nuclear armed neighbors. Um, uh, but it's also increasingly joining, be becoming integrated into the, the global arms control regimes uh, and, and has recently joined two of them. It's uh, expected to join at least one of them in the near future. Um, given all of these developments around the world that we've been discussing, uh, both at the global level, at the regional level, should India be reassessing its uh, position 
uh, when it comes to not just disarmament, but it, it's, its attitude towards nuclear weapons? Thanks, uh, thanks Dubba, and I'll uh, answer in a couple of different ways. I think one first primary point that India has to make, uh, India has been trying to do, is that India has always remained an anti-proliferationist. Despite the fact that we have remained outside the treaty regime and so on and so forth, India's commitment to uh, the idea of anti-proliferation, non-proliferation has remained steadfast right in the beginning. And unlike some of the, so India has supported the logic of non-proliferation right from the beginning. Even for instance, uh, there have been countries like uh, China and France who have, at, at the beginning at least, for a while, they questioned the logic of uh, non-proliferation, but they later on changed and joined, of course, the treaty. Uh, but unlike, unlike those two countries, India has always uh, has supported the idea of non-proliferation and therefore believed that more countries acquiring nuclear weapons is a dangerous thing. Uh, we have stood outside the NPT regime and some of the other technology uh, clubs, so to say, but I think the commitment to non-proliferation has remained very, very important for India. And I think if you look at India's uh, overall track record in this regard, despite the opportunity for India to actually proliferate sometime in the 90s, early 1990s, India has stepped away from such, uh, such ten uh, temptations and uh, stood by the anti-proliferation records that India wanted to maintain. And that's one point. But I think the second point there is also, because I think India believes that more countries acquiring nuclear weapons, and therefore even there are two nuclear neighborhoods uh, in, the, in our neighborhood, but I think you also have a larger problem if you look at the system per se, the nuclear non-proliferation order per se. There, is, uh, there are certain weaknesses to it that are emerging in the last few, several years now. One, for instance, look at the case of North Korea. Even though it may not be a direct threat to India's national security, but they are developing longer range missiles which could potentially reach India, but okay, of course they have not uh, targeted in India as a potential threat as a, as a country that they want to target. But the problem is also the uh, issues around the glo global nuclear order and the weakness of that is illustrative of the problem that we see with vis -a -vis North Korea and Iran to some extent. Then you have the eight countries, the proliferation web that existed e earlier. Uh, non -prol uh, nuclear proliferation that took place into Iran, Libya, North Korea, and all of those things show both the weakness of the system, but also the how it hurts us. Our own national interests are being hurt in the, long, in the longer term. And therefore, I think I come to the second point as to why we need to pursue uh, the global nuclear uh, disarmament agenda, which is a moral imperative that I would put it as. But I think, again, India has, uh, despite the fact that we have gone, uh, gone overtly nuclear, we have stood by the idea of global nuclear non-proliferation. But pursuing Article 6 nuclear non-disarmament uh, agenda has been stuck in a sense and there have not been too many supporters. The logic has not really seeped down in that sense among a large number of states. But aside from the point of the moral dilemma, I think, again, once again, I want to bring back to the point of purely pursuing from a realist national security uh, perspective, more countries acquiring nuclear weapons is inherently destabilizing. And therefore, I think India, all of this would suggest that India needs to pursue any number of efforts to be part of the regime, to strengthen the regime, part of the be part of the regime, but being outside the tent in that sense, uh, so to say, outside the, uh, some of the mechanisms that uh, drive some of the, much of the objectives in the global nuclear order, uh, it is a bit tricky, but I think one of the one of the couple of different points one could take steps one could take. Uh, one is, for instance, if there is a violation of commitments in the, under the NPT, India, I think, take, should take the lead in calling upon them, naming and shaming them. I think that's one important step in strengthening the regime. Because I think at, at the end of the day, it is in India's interest to strengthen the regime. And even if you are talking about ex ex um, establishing a new regime, I think the, some of the principles that would guide India's approach would remain the same of being an anti-proliferationist and that no more countries acquiring nuclear weapons is inherently destabilizing in nature. And now that we have crossed the tent and got uh, ourselves as a nuclear weapon state, and, and I think at the end of the day, states would behave very selfish. We want to close the door and make sure that others don't go down that path. That's, a, that's the reality at the end of the day in international relations. Let's, let's say candid, but the, uh, you know, a couple, a couple of points. One on North Korea, um, as North Korea develops its own nuclear uh, missile capabilities, in particular, uh, you know, we do have a history of Pakistan and North Korea cooperating, and and what may in the early late eighties and early nineties been a, a swap arrangement where Pakistan shared nuclear technology with North Korea, and North Korea shared missile technology with with Pakistan. Are there 
uh, renewed concerns now that uh, with North Korea accelerating its mi missile program that, that there may be uh, there may be consequences closer to home for India. And related, um, I as Pakistan develops tactical nuclear weapons, uh, there, there have been questions raised, I mean, less in government but more outside of government as to how India should respond to that. Um, how do you think, where, where do you f uh, fit in, in, the, in this debate on, on, on wh how India should respond to uh, Pakistan's development of tactical nuclear weapons? I think there are still questions unanswered when it comes to Pakistan's tactical nuclear weapons. One is the whole command and control structure is that very clear because you one does see reports, one reads reports um, uh, citing both uh, cases saying that one says set of reports that say that these issues have been resolved and the battle commander has the, has the, go, uh, has essentially the, he can go ahead with if there is a, a perception that there are, they're they going to be, uh, uh, they are going to be under threat. But at the same time, there are also reports that suggest that this is not really the case. The battle commanders still do not have that kind of an access and they still have to go back to the NCA in a sense. So there are issues about but uh, how do you, how does India respond to this? I think that's an interesting question. I think again, there is an internal uh, slow debate on this particular aspect, but uh, from my own perspective, I would say that that's uh, again, a danger, dangerous path to take and that's India should be, a, India has behaved as a responsible nuclear weapon state and I think we should continue that and not respond to Pakistan to, uh, one, one for one in a sense, even if they have developed the tactical nuclear weapons. And at the end of the day, I think it's going to be destabilizing entire for the entire Southern Asian region and I don't think India should pursue, uh, go down that particular path. On, on the challenge of North Korea to Pakistan missile proliferation? Absolutely, I think that's, uh, one is the uh, North Korea-Pakistan uh, missile linkages, but also the fact that uh, North Korea, at least some of the reports have now confirmed that North Korea has conducted the hydrogen bomb. Again, what does that impact and the implications for Southern Asia? That does, is there more technology transfer and kind of know-how uh, between Pakistan and North Korea? The linkages, in a sense, I would draw between uh, China, uh, China, Pakistan, North Korea, in a, in a, it's not very confirming, but at the same time, there are those uh, unconfirmed linkages, and I think I would be, uh, India should be sort of mindful of that particular linkage. Uh, before I open it up to the audience, uh, Professor Shen, um, uh, one uh, other big development has been uh, the advancement of hypersonic technologies, and China has actually been at the forefront of that. Do you think that are we opening up a new, the prospect of a new type of arms race in, in that domain? Uh, uh, not, not just China, but of course the United States and others following. Uh, our official uh, news outlet has not reported this. Okay. So we have to take uh, those Western uh, press story as a reference. Mm -hmm. First, I would assume this uh, story are not a fake news. <laughs> but why China do? Uh, my Research indicates China respond. Someone is leading, and we feel upset. America used to develop nuclear weapons for a good purpose, to deter Nazi Germany. But General MacArthur said he is going to use nuclear weapon, even without the authorization of the US president. So he had to be sacked. But China was scared. So China changed its mentality, nuclear weapon as a paper tiger, to be a real tiger. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to be bitten. We have to build our own tiger. And we made it. Once we made it, we say, let's negotiate to have a global zero. Uh, nobody respond. Mm -hmm. But still, we uh, intentionally keep our own capability way behind, probably 1% one, 1 of that of the US and the Soviet Union at the peak time. Now we have more money, we can do more, but we intentionally keep us uh, to make it our status to be way behind of that US and probably from Russia. Mm. But then US started to do star war and uh, China and later on Russia feel concerned. We say, don't do it, let's negotiate. US say, no, 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 let's use space, outer space peacefully, but uh, we say, no weaponization as a matter of peaceful use. USA military could also as a peaceful use. So we have been working on this for 20 years to no avail. And now America start to do uh, ultrasonic uh, vehicle. So we are upset. Our experience is that if we talk to US, US will not listen. Until you have it, 
US would develop this water. Then we may have a, ch a chance to talk. Let's put a ceiling, don't raise. But if you would lead, seeking your absolute security, we would be in an absolute insecure position. No way. That's not uh, 1950s. This is 21st century. We have the money, we have the resource, and now we got the gut and the will. Don't do. If you do, you don't get the net gain. But other countries might be feel upset. China, US are racing, and they have a capability, and we have to catch up. This is a security, typical security dilemma. So I would still urge US don't do. Second, we talk together to put a ceiling. Don't develop a de destabilizing technology. Don't build a, uh, beyond what we already have. And uh, let's go down in a bilateral negotiated way. And uh, to put more country to, to uh, make them a part of a global compact, don't do. Mm -hmm. This is what I would personally urge. So it seems like some of the contradictions you know, uh, are best captured, I think, in the person of President Obama, who started his presidency uh, by giving a, a rather utopian uh, speech on disarmament in Prague, uh, but ended his presidency, uh, by the time he ended his presidency, <coughs> had authorized perhaps the largest overhaul and modernization of the US nuclear mm. uh, program uh, in, in its history. Uh, so uh, I, I think that it, it s we, we see sort of similar threads sort of I think throughout uh, all our countries and, and uh, affecting both several regions but also the, the global nuclear uh, environment. Uh, let me open this up to, to questions. I would ask everybody, uh, make it a question or a comment, but please stick to one. Uh, so no three-part questions, please. Um, and let's maybe take two or three at a time and then, and then come back to, to, to people. So let's start here. The gentleman over here, I saw his hand up first. Uh, no, I'm sorry, behind you. <laughs> and if you could please introduce yourself. And by the way, I think there are some microphones here, so if people want to stand up at the, at the microphones, line up, maybe that would be a best, best way to, to, to so, sir, please. All right, my name is Vinod Segal. I'm the author of the book, Third Millennium Equipoise, which I'm sure all the panelists would have been, have read. I'm going to refer to a statement made about the utopian nature of disarmament. I will invite the invent attention of all present here to a paper that was put out by Dr. Ira Heffmund, the head of IPPNW. I was there in Switzerland when he presented that paper yes. on what a limited exchange between two countries would lead to at least 500 million casualties in China and over a period of time because of the sun's yes. weakening over the corn belt, a couple of hundred million people mm -hmm. there. I think the time has come for all such conferences to be talking of that utopian thing, nuclear disarmament, and not the other way around. Yeah. The second just point. No, no, point. So if you could please Sorry. keep it to one, because I think we had many, qu many hands up. Thank so, you, sir, uh, the gentleman behind you. Uh, I'll call on a few more. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I'm Georgi Fedora, Rustomir Foundation from Russia, and I've spent uh, about four decades working on Korea. And my question goes to Ambassador Sherman. Uh, well, now I see the growing dichotomy between the policies of US and South Korea. South Korea is engaged in dialogue and uh, we're trying to, uh, to arrange the peaceful Olympics and whether to prolong Olympic truce, while the US is uh, bent on pressure, increased pressure, which the last Canada-Vancouver conference has shown. How do you think uh, this issue will be handled in the coming months after the Olympic is over? Will there be a large scale uh, military exercises that can provoke uh, North Korea or will there be dialogue? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's do one question. There are a number of hands up here. So yes, so, so, uh, yes, with your hand up, sir, if you could. Okay. Uh, no, no, uh, sorry, uh, not General Shopper. Yes, you, yeah, if you could please go to your mic. And <laughs> uh, thank you, sir. Sir, my name is Ayush Sharma and my question uh, is to anyone uh, from the uh, anyone who can answer from the panel sir uh, i would like to know if uh, any uh, bilateral exchange of uh, uh, nuclear uh, nuclear weapon have taken place like say uh, nuclear weapon uh, war between india and pakistan uh, don't you think uh, the nuclear fallout or uh, the, let's say the nuclear dust which may uh, go in the uh, in, uh, which may leave the uh, re uh, reason and uh, reach to the other countries also. So in those scenarios, don't you think uh, bilateral nuclear exchange may create a multilateral 
uh, socio-economic political crisis and how to deal with it and also uh, how we manage to uh, deal with the post-war uh, post situations. Thank you. Uh, the lady uh, here, please. I'm Dr. Roshan from USI. My question is to anybody from the panelists. We were talking about nuclear and unpredictability by, uh, created by North Korea and Iran, but my question is the nuclear weapons diversification by other nuclear weapon states, like the underwater nuclear drone being developed, the nuclear posture review may be more uh, aggressive in terms of having tactical nukes, and hypersonic glide vehicles, which are becoming dual in nature, so in this scenario, how do we bring the nuclear disarmament back to the table, and how do we manage the nuclear environment? Thank you. Uh, why don't you take, uh, I'm not so sure, maybe there was one question directed specifically to you. Do you want to uh, address that? Or? Mm -hmm. That is what the happened at the Olympics? Yes, right. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. <coughs> uh, you know, I don't represent the US administration, um, and quite frankly, on many issues, we disagree profoundly, uh, but I think that you know, this is really not just a decision for the United States. This is a decision for the international community. And one of the things that is most important is that we all be united in believing that uh, North Korea with nuclear weapons is not a good idea. Uh, and so I think that the effort to use sanctions uh, to get North Korea to come to the table in seriousness, and let me say quickly, sanctions never stop bad behavior. Sanctions only focus the mind. When the Europeans began negotiating with Iran in the early 2000s, they had 164 centrifuges. At the time, we all got into very serious negotiations with Iran after the most oppressive sanctions uh, and effective sanctions, they had 19,000 centrifuges. So people ought to be very conscious about what sanctions do and what they do not do. So I think sanctions are important. I think diplomacy is important. I think military deterrence is important. I think intelligence is important. Uh, awareness of cyber and, and bioweapons is important. But this is really a decision for the international community to put the same kind of pressure on North Korea to come to the table in seriousness with the United States being very open and ready uh, for dialogue, understanding this is a long path. Uh, one last comment I'll make on this. Uh, I was telling uh, my Russian colleague here that I was at a very good nonproliferation conference in Moscow a few months ago. Um, the North Koreans, it was a very strange conference because the North Koreans were there, the Iranians were there, the Chinese were there, the Japanese were there, uh, the South Koreans and the Americans were there. So it was a very curious conference. But uh, Madam Che, who headed the North Korean delegation, uh, said that uh, she was not open to multilateral negotiations, that uh, the United States was the only hostile power here, uh, and uh, they wanted to talk only to the United States. So I think we need to be open to those discussions, but we should do those discussions in very close consultation, if not actual participation by others that have serious interests in what occurs here, obviously starting with South Korea and Japan. And China and Russia as well. Uh, I, I, just one second, I'm just going to ask a quick follow-up question, but then you're, you're welcome to answer after that. But um, I, I know you're no longer a U.S. official, um, and so if you would like to pass on this question, I mm. would completely understand, though. Um, but you mentioned a number of things that brought Iran to the negotiating table, um, a, a whole panoply of positive and negative inducements. Mm -hmm. um, Stuxnet? Uh, <laughs> the only thing I can say about Stuxnet is, uh, which was reported for those of you who don't know, in the New York Times, uh, I can't talk about it as an official matter, but the New York Times reported that the United States uh, put malware into the system to try to uh, kill off the centrifuge technology in Iran. Uh, cyber is a huge, huge issue. I think our Australian colleague was quite right to talk about the interactions here. Uh, among these issues because cyber can come back to bite you, uh, and obviously North Korea has serious cyber capabilities, as does Iran, as does Russia, uh, as uh, <laughs> we've discussed uh, when we were waiting for this, uh, and, and China, uh, about which we 
have had some good and, and useful discussions in starting a dialogue with China on cyber capabilities. Uh, so I think uh, one has to be very, very careful in using cyber uh, as an offensive uh, tool. Very careful. Sorry, I, I didn't. Uh, thank you very yeah. much. I would like to add also that um, concerning efficiency of uh, uh, negotiations with North Korea, we have to take into account uh, several facts. First of all, uh, uh, North Korea is, uh, is remembering, uh, North Korean regime is remembering what has happened to Libya. You know, in uh, 2003, Libya received guarantee from the United States and Great Britain and stopped its uh, nuclear military program. What has happened then? Okay, second fact. Uh, North Korea is looking attentively, I'm sure about it, to uh, uh, the process uh, around uh, Iranian nuclear deal. If uh, uh, the United States will leave uh, the deal and uh, uh, it will be collapse of uh, this you know, uh, uh, effort of international community, it will be the worst factor uh, for, uh, for any negotiations with North Korea. Third, uh, you know, uh, yesterday uh, President Trump criticized Russia for not being helpful on North Korea. Oh, okay. For many years, Russia was helpful uh, on Iran and was helpful on North Korea, and uh, Ambassador Sherman can prove it. Uh, but right now, if Russia is on the same uh, uh, package of sanctions, uh, on, on the same bill, uh, under the same bill of the U.S. Congress signed by the President, together with North Korea and Iran, what do you want from Russia? You want it to be helpful? Thank you. Yeah, sure. one, one <laughs> point. I, I do want to remind my Russian colleague here that there are UN Security Council resolutions that have quite and serious Russia sanctions. It. Russia, and Russia supported, supported it, it, and Russia must enforce them. <laughs> okay. Why um, just to, I'll, I'll lump the other questions together, but uh, I mean, basically, whether given the nature of nuclear weapons, given the nature of changing technologies, <coughs> is the future of the global nuclear order going to be bilateral in nature? or uh, you know, a set of bilateral arrangements, or will it be a multilateral arrangement? Rory or Raji, would you, do either of you want to address that? So I'll, I'll jump in and uh, maybe address one or two of the other remarks that I've heard as well. I mean, I think, the, um, I, I, I think it's useful for us to cast our minds back, as you said, Druva, to the beginning of the Obama administration and to Obama's vision and initiative and the Prague speech and so forth, and I think you know, although I've perhaps slightly provocatively used the word utopian to describe um, abolitionist sentiment, I think, I, you know, I, I think there, there were lost opportunities at that time. Um, I, I would have a slightly different reading of, of nuclear history to my uh, Chinese colleague, uh, Shunping Li, on this. I think the, uh, the Obama administration was quite surprised and disappointed at the, uh, the way that China did or did not take up uh, its overtures on, on nuclear disarmament at that time. And I think that the, um, the idea now that this is all going to be a US-Russia game uh, and that the rest of the world has to wait on US-Russia for any kind of arms control is, is certainly going to be out of date. So I now see um, multiple bilateral uh, processes and frankly of arms control, not of disarmament at, at this stage. Um, I do think that the Chinese modernization hasn't been emphasized enough in this conversation as part of that, because I think that if you look at the US nuclear posture review now, one of the factors it's responding to is really the, uh, the lost opportunity of the, uh, of the Obama years. So going to, connecting that point, I guess, to the questions about nuclear use and the new technologies and so forth, um, I think one of our friends in the room you know, pointed to the catastrophic impacts of a, of a nuclear exchange. And I think what we have to bear in mind here is that even the use of a single nuclear weapon could have such a disruptive global impact. It could be the it would it would be the greatest strategic shock since I would say 1939. Forget 9/11. Um, you know, in in in, in that regard. Um, but the impact could be either an acceleration of disarmament and a mobilisation of that uh, I guess utopian vision internationally, but alternately it could well be a proliferation cascade. It could be a world of, 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 of uh, much more usable nuclear weapons. Uh, finally, on that diversification point, I think uh, underwater technology was mentioned, and that's one area where I have particular concerns because as 
a number of countries in the region introduce uh, SSBNs, including India, but, but uh, also very much China, and potentially Pakistan and North Korea putting nuclear weapons under the sea. We're actually, I think, in for a phase of instability as countries learn how to deploy uh, those systems and come to terms with the intersection with, with maritime tensions uh, in the South China Sea and elsewhere. And for me, that's, that's that should be pretty high on our agenda ahead of long-term disarmament aspirations, which I think at this stage uh, are a pretty forlorn hope. Do you Thank, want to uh, win? Yeah, thanks, Ruba. I think that's an excellent question about the what kind of formats would you have in the future. And I think um, given the state of the regime today that we are faced with, uh, where there is essentially none of the great powers can come together, agree upon the challenges and the ways to deal with it, uh, the lack of consensus has emerged as the biggest uh, problem, in a sense, in bringing together um, and working on a, a future mechanisms and kind of things. For instance, look at the CB. This uh, conference on disarmament has been stalemated for more than two decades. So none of the arms control talks have anywhere made any progress because of that. And therefore, essentially, what we might be looking at is a number of bilateral as well as regional uh, CBMs. But those are only technical fixes for the time being. If those are not long-term, long-enduring uh, mechanisms, in a sense. So therefore, we should try and break that logjam that we are in, the stalemate that we are faced with, both within the CB and other, uh, other platforms. Uh, when it comes to uh, nuclear and other arms control issues. So I think that's uh, dealing with that, those set of political issues among the big powers uh, that have continued to hamper the uh, nuclear, nuclear regime, I think that should be one of the priority areas. Meanwhile, we might have CBMs which are only temporary fixes and not long-term solutions. But let me just add to the point of the nuclear disarmament question. I think that's a... Uh, I think we are taking up the issue of nuclear disarmament at a very wrong time at this point of time. Mm -hmm. Given that the, there is a global shifting power, a balance of power, and also three, uh, three, two or three rising powers in Asia, it's not the perfect time to take up the issue because I think every single country is going to be pursuing more, acqu acquiring more hard power capabilities, including nuclear weapons, unfortunately. So I don't think the salience of the nuclear weapons, even for the established powers, the salience of nuclear weapons is not going to go away. It's become very critical in their nuclear strategy, in their national security strategies. So I even as it is, it's an ideal goal to reach, I don't think we are going to make much uh, realistic progress on the issue of nuclear disarmament. Uh, two minutes, uh, one minute on the question of India, Pakistan, and what might happen. And I think in my own, uh, my own personal view is that I think Pakistan e continues to be a r rational actor, even as it projects itself as an irrational one, ready to press the nuclear button. But I think they are a set of rational actors and will not go down the path of, you know, uh, using even tactical nuclear weapons. Use of tactical or strategic nuclear weapons, I think the response from India would be the same, and therefore I think Pakistan is uh, mindful of what it impi uh, uh, implies in terms of the implications. Uh, but at the same time, they have created this you know, sense that they are, they are, you know, they are, uh, they are irrational and they are, they are seriously under existential threat and so on and so forth. But I think they are a bunch of uh, irrational uh, leaders. And we should, but the fear of escalation, I think that's always there in the political leader, uh, in the political minds. Um, so that's an issue that we need to deal with. Thank you, uh, Parisha, uh, You know, China uh, has relatively few bilateral agreements on its uh, nuclear agreements with, you know, whether it's confidence building measures or, 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 or other steps, and entering into them would require a greater deal of transparency about China's nuclear program. Do you think China is ready for, for those kinds of arrangements? Uh, I would respond more broadly. Yeah. I would uh, say in the future we should de-emphasize the importance of nuclear weapon in our national security uh, uh, planning for all country. Uh, the upcoming U.S. Uh, new edition of nuclear post review seems to go against it uh, to lower the threshold of using nuclear weapon, emphasizing the usable nuclear weapon. Uh, that would uh, greatly blur the, uh, the line between nuclear weapon and uh, uh, conventional weapon. And uh, it's unhelpful to speak North Korea and Iran. And the U.S. can use nuclear weapon on the ground that the U.S. is attacked uh, with major casualty. What is the definition of major casualty? In my personal view, we would uh, use nuclear weapon only when national security is at stake. Of course, this is a vague uh, kind of definition. Uh, without uh, having national survival at stake, we should not uh, think about uh, using nuclear weapon. We have multiple choice, conventional choice to respond. I think uh, even America is hit by a 9-1-1 scale uh, terrorist strike, 
American still has lots of conventional means to respond. And so far, American has done uh, not to evoke nuclear weapon. So the upcoming Trump edition of the NPR could be uh, dangerous. Mm -hmm. And given this, what we should do? All means, first, uh, unilaterally. China does not need to wait for a summit of no first use. And uh, Russian used to have no first use. For some reason, Russia would open more possibility. But uh, China has its unilateral uh, no first use. Of course, no, not all would believe in it. But uh, China may have the virtual de-mating, which would make our uh, no first use credible. First, unilateral. Second, bilateral. As the US and the so uh, Russia still have thousands of nuclear systems uh, in the active ser service and in stockpile. And uh, it's uh, unreasonable to summon a global nuclear disarmament immediately. These two countries should, should act first. We should not use argument that uh, the US and uh, Russia have all kinds of trouble. This trouble would uh, warrant the continuing nuclear disarmament after Moscow Treaty uh, necessary because they don't need to each side to possess thousands of nuclear weapons. It's a burden, it's not a, an asset. So they don't need to use the argument, I don't talk to you, since you don't meet my expectation. This hurts their respect for national security and not in the interest of global uh, security. Third, multilateral. Why the US and uh, Russia need to find an excuse to talk? We cannot sit idle, not to have a global si system. But what to talk? Global de-alerting, global no, uh, no first use, global nuclear CBM, confidence building measure. We can do a lot. Find all excuse to, to, to do, rather than not to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we only have time for a couple of very quick questions, so I'll call on the two people who had their hands up uh, at the end, so this gentleman here, and then there was one right in the back, somebody who waved a paper. Uh, yes, yes, you after that. Uh, but if you could please keep the questions, uh, come to the microphone, and please keep the questions very short and pointed, and preferably to one of the speakers. My name is Keith Shankar Goyal. So I was working with a company called Areva, based out in Paris, selling the nuclear reactors. So I quitted them. I've been working between France, Germany, UK, and India, mm -hmm. bringing the investment to India. So my question is towards the, you know, the civil side of the nuclear, because I've been involved in this subject since a long time, and it's a major issue. Uh, I would like to remind you, in the last government, they put everything on the state to bring these nuclear reactors to India. French companies, um, France has been uh, not very vocal, but the U.S. company, they have been very vocal about it, the nuclear liability clause and tariff mm -hmm. system. Yes. So my question is just to Ms. Rajeshwari, because yes. she is based out in India. Uh, so in, can you give us the more insight in terms, of, in terms of the nuclear liability clause tariff and give us more insight, I mean, where exactly with the time frame this, all these nuclear deals with the US and France are likely to take place. Thank you very much. And sir? Thank you, my name is Ramesh Ramachandran. I'm a journalist with Beyond Television. My question has already been partly answered by Ambassador Sherman and Mr. Voltoisky. So if I can ask uh, Professor Shen to, uh, for his thoughts on the issue. Just to take off on the point, Mr. Voltoisky mentioned about uh, Kim Jong-un, when he looks around the world, he says how the US has treated Saddam Hussein in Iraq, or Muhammad Gaddafi in, in, in Libya, or how it approaches the Iran nuclear deal. So what's the sense, the Chinese view on, on the US policy towards North Korea under present circumstances? Also, North Korea says, one, it is open for talks, two, only with the US, and three, without preconditions. Uh, and last point, uh, Professor Shen, uh, is, it, is, it, is it true that China is also hedging on the North Korean issue, and why is it more coming out more categorically in the open about its, its position? on North Korea, thank you. So I, I think that last question was answered at the beginning, so I think uh, we, if you, just in the interest of time, if you could uh, maybe just address the how, how China is seeing uh, US, you know, the US posture to, to other countries that have voluntarily or, or given up nuclear weapons. On the US approach to uh, DPRK, my personal take is that uh, China shares the objective with US completely to denuclearize the DPRK. For this, we are comrades of America. We share the, uh, the same objective, no difference. Zero nuclear weapon, no threat to America and to the region. No shoot missile to so close to Guam. That's provocative. 
that forced China to extend its sanction from pure missile and nuclear to some civilian areas. So we cut 50% uh, uh, of the oil. We refuse uh, the, a lot of their coal in order not to give their, some, their, our money. So they don't get a foreign currency. That would make their operation uh, more uh, 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 difficult. We differ fundamentally with the US on some of the approach. That is, uh, initially, unless DPRK would abandon nuclear weapon, US would not talk to them. We think this should be uh, proceeded in parallel. Each side should act and they should coordinate, not wait for North Korea. US is a power, is a global power, should lead, maybe to give more concession to North Korea then to uh, allure North Korea to do more. So far, US has failed for President uh, Clinton, President George W. Bush, and uh, uh, Obama. Now, US is again failing, probably for the entire tenure of uh, uh, Trump. That would make North Korea to get more and more nuclear weapon. That is against the US objective. So US maybe is using the wrong approach to achieve the good objective. Therefore, China cannot agree with the US. And we propose our own way, setting denuclearization as the ultimate goal, but act pragmatically. At this time, DPRK should do four no's. No more testing, no more production of fissile material for weapon purpose, and then no threat of using nuclear weapon first against others, and no export of such a dangerous material. Luckily, America uh, Secretary of State responded with four no's. No top of the regime, uh, no change of government, no crossing the 38 degree parallel uh, northward by the US force deployed in South Korea, and uh, uh, not to promote a quick reunification between the two Koreans. And uh, later on, American side leadership said, we want to talk, even to talk about uh, the temperature, the, the weather, we want to find a way to talk. Look. This is American pragmatism. If you set the bar so high, let's talk about the denuclearization, no meeting. Let's meet without a particular condition. Then you may find an excuse to talk. So I think America is making progress. That's good. Sometimes the White House would deny the, the uh, good uh, 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 di uh, diplomacy by the State Department. I hope through more internal debate, America would generate a more sensible policy. Uh, with what uh, former Secretary of War and Secretary of State used to say, uh, idealism with pragmatic step. This is uh, 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 Secretary Henry Stimson used to say. Uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, Dr. Sun Ying is sitting in the room. And uh, this is the name of Henry Stimson used to say, Plag idealism with pragmatic step. China's proposal of Suspension for suspension. DPRK, don't commit to denuclearizing now, but at least commit not to continue to shoot. Americans don't commit to stop military exercise with South forever, but at least commit not to do it in the next few months during the Winter Olympic, at least for three months before April. That's a good start. Personally, I would assume North Korea would assume this testing. But if the two sides would interact in a constructive way, maybe they can extend this kind of no testing, no shooting for more months. Let's uh, hope, let's uh, prepare for the worst, but uh, work for the best. I can see the Ambassador Sherman wants to jump in. Unfortunately, we don't have the time. But uh, Raji, if you could just briefly address the issue. I mean, we, we didn't actually have time and to discuss this. In the interest of time, I'm just going to keep it very brief. Uh, so having successfully negotiated the US-India nuclear deal and the energy waiver being procured, I think we are stuck at the nuclear uh, liability bill. But amending the bill within the, the, within the country, it's a, politically, it's a political suicide for any country, any government to undertake that mission. But I think the government is finding different ways to uh, resolve that issue. One, one is the obviously finding the a consortium of uh, insurance companies and so on and so forth. But I think we are going to take this conversation offline to have. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for joining me. Thank you to all the panelists.